Great, the door's closed, so here we go. Uh, my name is Michael. I am a security researcher at Orange Cyber Defense. You can find me on the social things uh, mostly lurking um, at those handles. And my talk is called No Touch, and the reason for the 10 errors will become apparent soon enough. Um, I am an ex software engineer, DevOps engineer. Um, I studied electronic engineering, and so I, while I mostly work with computers to make a living, I like to play with hardware when I get a chance, and I am a Hex Coffee, Hexcon, B-Sides, uh, well, former B-Sides organizer. Um, I also like to say I'm kind of a rebel. The reason I say that is because the photographer who was taking shot, like pictures of all the people who were working and wanted pictures, um, I asked him if I could, he was telling me how to stand and how to look, how to smile, and I asked, can I stand with my arms folded like this? And he said, no. And so, <laughs> kinda, I kind of just do what I want. I just, want, just wanted to put it out there, I'm sort of a badass. Anyway, so the talk is centered around this thing. Now, I'm sure you've all seen this before, it's quite a common thing that, uh, yeah, they're all over the place. This is one variant of them. There are a couple of others. They all look different, but they all function exactly the same way. Um, and they serve various purposes. So the one is to um, exit an area that you are allowed to be in. So on one side, there will be key fob or code or biometrics or something. And on the other side, there will be one of these. Um, and for anyone who's used them, you know that if you put your hand somewhere between centi 10 centimeters or you know, one, sometimes you have to get really, really close, but you gotta put your hand pretty close to the thing and then it triggers and then something happens. So they're also used for ticket issuing for parkades, boom opening for parking areas. Um, so in Joburg we have these things because we wanna keep people trapped inside in case something happens. I don't know, Joburg's weird, but I live there now. Um, and the thing that I noticed, and the reason that I got interested in these things is because um, I noticed that they were on the secure side of, of areas that you, you shouldn't otherwise be allowed to get into, which is fine because you can only you know, put your hand in front of them and then it will let you out. And you have to be in the secure area for that to work. But I thought maybe, maybe that's not entirely true. So I, I, I went down a bit of a rabbit hole. Um, yeah, so this goes on to why do I care about this? They protect areas that you can't get into otherwise. And yeah, they have been defeated before. So shout out to Simon who wasted some office supplies, um, took a piece of wire and a paper and sort of got it through the door and used that to, to trigger it. Um, but I thought maybe there's a more impactful way. Like not all doors have gaps and you know, it's, not always, it's not always easy to implement an attack like that. Um, so I started looking into how they work and as to whether there was some viability to this. So there were a couple of options. So from a black box perspective, there were a few possibilities. The one, I mean, they, they pick up proximity. So your hand gets close, they switch. So there are a few ways that this is possible. The one was ultrasonic, not likely because there was sort of a solid opaque, oh, semi-opaque um, cover and sound usually wants some kind of a grill to get through. Um, that would block a lot of sounds, so not likely that. Uh, radar, I put there for fun because it's also just entirely nonsensical. Um, it would work technically, but it's just gonna be way too expensive and it's just the wrong technology. So we're left with optical. So opticals, super simple. Um, the premise is that it uh, emits the light and picks up the reflection, and if it picks up enough of a reflection, then you know it's, it's, it's got a a uh, positive signal. So the other hints that it was probably light that we were dealing with is that the plastic over there, if you take a picture of these things with the light on, you'll see that there's sort of a red glow and it's the same way that 3D glasses work, or the old school 3D glasses. So generally that red kind of tinge um, suggests that uh, infrared light is allowed to permit uh, pass through the, th the lens. Um, so the 3D glasses, the same thing happens. The blue lens allows blue light, the red, light, uh, red lens allows red light, and so your, each eye sees a different thing. So that was hint number one. We're probably dealing with infrared reflectance. So we have some idea of how this thing works. 
But to figure out anything more um, is going to require opening it up. So 270 round later, we have the insides of this. So it's no longer a black box. Um, it's sort of a clear box, I guess. Well, the box is gone. I don't know where the box went. So <laughs> I've opened this thing up. Um, I bought this in November 2019, which is kind of interesting to note because the production date on the thing says June 2019, so that's like a couple of months later, which suggests that these things are being produced at quite a rate um, because usually that, you know, that, that gap isn't so small if these things are sitting in a stockroom somewhere and there's excess of them. Um, the other thing is that 2019 was a year before 2020, where they got super popular because people got all into not touching stuff. <laughs> um, so yeah, that was the front and the back of it, which is not, we're going to have to go into the, the nitty gritty of it, but this is the shroud that goes in the front. Um, so if you look here, there's um, one light that emits and another that receives, and this little shroud is what stops the two from comp like directly interacting with one another. The light has to go out of the device and come back via some reflective thing like a human hand or a piece of paper. So, first things first, multimeter, just a shout out to the humble multimeter. Anybody who has any interest in electronics, this is where you start. And you start in continuity mode and you touch things and you wait for the beep and then you know that the things that you're touching are connected together. And that's, that's like so much of hardware reverse engineering is just doing that. Rogan, not Rogan, uh, Dale's talk just now, uh, that's what he spent hours and hours doing with sea shanties and warm beverages, um, figuring out how a keyboard was mapped. It's just this on continuity mode. So if you don't have one, like change that. Um, so through a, a process of poking at things and visually identifying and you know just knowledge I had before, I figured out that this was kind of the structure of it. So these are all the different things and what they do. Not super important, but now I have an idea of how it, w it functioned. So, nominal test was to adjust the sensor to work from 10 centimeters away. So you'll have noticed anyone who's used these things before, the sensitivity is not constant. Some of them work like really well. Some of them you look at and they switch. The other ones, not so much. You kind of have to almost touch them. Um, and there's a sensitivity knob for that. So I adjusted it to be 10 centimeters as my sort of baseline. Um, and the goal is, of course, to see if I can extend this range somehow. In a typical application, the no-touch sits inside a secure area, and there's a glass door, there's biometrics or something on the outside, the attacker's outside, and you want to kind of bounce it off the wall. So it's, it's quite ambitious, what I'm, what I'm doing. Um, but yeah, we're going to see, see how we do. So attack number one, mirrors. So the thing that emits infrared and detects a reflection, and hands are not super reflectors, but mirrors, mirrors are better at reflecting things. So here's a picture of a mirror I took. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, the, like, yeah, this is, this is the best I could do. Um, but it is very reflective. There's my phone, and there's my hand, it's everything. Um, and lining it up perfectly, a flat, normal mirror, I managed to get 60 centimeters range, which isn't like a crazy amount, but it's six times nominal, which was, you know, it was quite a, a result. Um, but given the, the, the attack scenario, it's not, it's, not, it's not ideal. So the next option was fun mirrors, which are like normal mirrors, but fun. So the concave mirrors work in a way that, because they're bent, this, um, picture on the left hand side is uh, the concave mirror. The light that hits the mirror sort of converges at a point. So there is a point at which, like there's an ideal distance depending on the design of the mirror, but in general, they kind of magnify stuff and you, know, you can get a better range out of these things um, because they're sort of magnifying what's coming at them. So testing with that, I managed to get two meters, which is 20 times the nominal range, which is cool. Like it, again, it's more than 10. Um, centimeters, but again, it's, uh, you know, that whole scenario of like through the wall, through the glass against the wall, all of that. So if by some chance they've made it very sensitive and it works at 20 centimeters, I get four meters, which is closer to being useful. 
but they're usually configured to work at like one because, I don't know, people want to see people suffer. Um, and the other thing that gets in our way here is all my tests so far have been line of sight. So I have another picture for you. This is a wall. <laughs> so as you can see, there is no reflection of, I mean, my hand and my phone are there, I promise. That's how I got the photo, but there is no, like you can't see that because walls don't reflect stuff like mirrors do. Um, in fact, like my hand, I don't know if any of you can, can anyone see their face in my hand right now? Okay, uh, okay, so one person, I'm, I would get that checked out. Um, <laughs> but the point is that kind of, yeah, it, um, it takes away from the success of the mirrors because a wall is not a mirror and that's kind of what we're dealing with in a realistic scenario. Anyway, so we'll shelve that for now. Um, Next thing was to have a look at how this thing worked internally and see if there were other approaches we could take here. So the first thing was to look at the sensitivity knob. This is how, where you adjust how far away it will work from. Um, and what was interesting with the teardown, so actually tracing the circuits, is that this doesn't affect the sensitivity at all. All it does is adjust how much current goes through the LED that emits and thus changing the brightness of the emitting LED. So this means that our sensitivity is actually constant. It's our strength of the, the emitted light that, that varies. Um, so this gets interesting when you start considering external light sources, because if you're in control of the power of the light, well, maybe um, you can use this to your advantage. So first thing is to see how does the thing work inside. Shout out to the humble, or less, slightly less humble logic analyzer because um, they're probably about 10 times the price of a multimeter, but they're really great. You can get them for cheap as well. Um, and this essentially gives you a, um, if you attach it to any electronic thing, I mean, within reason, some stuff will make the smoke come out, but for the most part, if you connect it to electronics, you get a, a signal analysis of the logic voltages over time. So you can see what pins are doing, and you can connect it like this, handy little clip that's designed for exactly this pin package. This is the same board that you saw earlier with the relays and the lights and all of that stuff. So connected directly and now you can see what's going on inside. So first thing I was looking at, what is being emitted? So it's emitting stuff really fast, this is the first thing. Um, and you can see here's sort of a timing diagram and zoomed in is the bottom one. So it's the same trace, just zoomed. Um, First thing that caught my eye is why are those blocks solid? If it was just on and off, then it should just be an empty square, but they're not. So we zoom and enhance. And we see this. So this is a very high frequency. If this was audio, you wouldn't hear it. It's well out of uh, perceivable range of human hearing. So it's, it's really, really quick. Um, and that brings us to the question, why is there a 30 kilohertz signal? Um, this is kind of important, so I'll quickly go over this, but light occurs naturally all over the place. Um, yeah, and infrared is no exception. So in this case, so here's a, infrared is often used for um, giving a, re a visual representation of uh, heat emitted by something. It's in a different wavelength, but it's still infrared. And so as you can see, this dog has it's, it's radiating some amount of infrared from its, its eyes and its mouth and its ears. And if the thing only responded, if the sensor only responded to naturally occurring um, light, or like the presence of infrared light, then if this dog opened its eyes inside a secure area, the door would open, and that's, <laughs> that's stupid. I mean, it weren't really, it's not the right wavelength, but you get the point, like, it's, it's too unpredictable. So what they do is, if you're using infrared for any kind of signaling application, including uh, TV remotes, works on a very, very similar principle. Um, TV remotes dictate a 38 kilohertz carrier frequency, but the principle remains the same. So instead of having on and off infrared, you've got a carrier, and if that's present, then you have an on signal. So that's all it is. So on is 30 kilohertz in this case, off is off. So introducing the receiver. This is the piece of hardware that receives the, uh, the, the reflected infrared. 
And you can see this is sort of the top of the data sheet. It's specced for 30 kilohertz. It says 45 meters range. I don't know how they decided that. Um, but anyway, 950 nanometers is the wavelength, which is fine. That's easy enough to get. Um, yeah, and this is, this is the thing that deals with um, receiving the signal. So here's another logic analyzer trace. So this is the next thing to see how does the receiver react when it's receiving a signal, so putting your hand in front. And as you can see, there's a 30 kilohertz carrier at the top, and then when the carrier is present, that pin goes low, and so those two correlate. There is no timing drift in here. In those two things were captured at exactly the same time. This is one screenshot. So this raised the question, why is there a lag? Why is this thing reacting after the, the stuff's happened? And there's a couple reasons to that. So you can see there's a little lag over there. I think you can measure it. There you go, 285 microseconds. It's not a lot of time, that's nine cycles. So I thought, well, maybe it's the speed of light, right? Light doesn't transmit like instantly. It takes time to get places. But I threw that into a calculator and said 85 meters. And my hand was here. So it wasn't that. That was the next thing. So I dug into it a little bit to try and figure out why, why is there this delay. The short answer is, well, it's the long answer, but I'll say the short answer. There's stuff inside the receiver. <laughs> what it is doesn't matter. Um, but the point is there's some amount of processing. It's not just a dumb component. There's gain control and band pass and you know, the, the things in the, in the screen. So there's stuff going on, and it's adding a delay, and it's... It's a processing delay. The, the context doesn't matter too much here, but what's interesting is that the delay is spec to be between seven and 15 cycles. So I don't know if you saw, but it said nine in that case, which is within that spec. But it isn't always predictably nine. Sometimes it might be more, sometimes it might be less. The ideal is apparently 10, you know, but we don't know. So that made me conclude it is not speed of light, it is just a processing delay, and it's not a constant. Which is great, because it means that there's tolerance. If the delay is not constant, it means we don't have to lock up like perfectly within phase of what the thing is emitting. So in theory, fingers crossed, we can just blast something at it that looks similar, and it will work. <laughs> Turns out it doesn't work like that. So this is just a quick sidebar on hardware hacking in general. Um, hardware design and hardware hacking are faced with the same problems. Um, in hardware design, it's a pain in the ass, but in hardware hacking, it's fantastic. So there's a bunch of things you need to account for. If it is too hot, if it's too cold, if there's too much interference, if the traces are too thin, if the moon is in retrograde, or <laughs> like there's so many things, the power, stability, timing, whatever. There's, there's a ton of stuff that can go wrong in hardware, and so you have to design to account for a lot of that stuff. Environmental stuff impacts how your hardware works, which means often hardware is made in a way that deals with that stuff, um, and, and it gives you tolerance, for example. So yeah, it, it makes it more likely that you're going to find a way in. So a lot of attacks for hardware are actually based on introducing interference or messing with the power stability or changing these environmental factors that are not accounted for. Um, so while hardware is a complex beast, there, is often, uh, there are often a lot of extra avenues you can take. Um, there's not just like, oh, we'll debug the software, it doesn't work, and then... So it's just, I think that's pretty cool, and it means that there's a lot you can do um, outside of the stuff. So three hints. Interfer infrared reflectance is how the thing works. Constant sensitivity, it doesn't matter if you're introducing an external light source, um, which is good for us. And the third thing is wide tolerances, so the timing doesn't have to be perfect. So nominal operation looks like this. If you put your hand in front of the sensor, the top is the emitter, the middle is what the receiver is picking up, and then eventually this is, the red line is the gate opening. So you'll see as I bring my hand closer, more of the emitted light is picked up by the receiver, and when enough of it matches, the door opens. So that's great. 
And then once the door's open, so that red line on the bottom when it's high, that means that the relay is energized, which means the, the door is open or unlocked or whatever. There's a, about a second into that, there's another pulse to just say, are you still there? If it receives a reflection, it stays open. And if not at the end, it will close again. So you may have noticed, if you put your hand, as soon as you take it away, it doesn't switch off immediately. It takes about a second. So, see, I had these last time and I didn't see them. I forgot to take them out again. Anyway, so if you emit a fixed signal, let's see what happens. So we've got a 30 kilohertz carry. We've measured that. So let's just blast it with 30 kilohertz and see what happens. So these are the timings. Um, so looking at how it does it, it's on for 14 milliseconds, it's off for 30. So we're gonna try and just replicate that pattern. Easy peasy. So here's the trace. The spoof signal is what I'm emitting at the top and you can see the receiver is picking that up and it's dropping the pin low. Great, it's reacting the way I'm expecting it to. And because the timing is not exact, the phase is kind of drifting as we go. And obviously the next slide is gonna show them going into phase and then the door's gonna open and then no, it didn't do that. So instead, as soon as there was some sort of overlap of the spoof signal and the emitted signal, the pattern changed. So it's clear on the right hand side, but the pattern is now different and the timing, like it's completely different to what I initially tried. So I figured this is probably some method to, um, you know, to uh, fight against spoof signals and to um, yeah, prevent external interference from opening the doors, which made me sad. Um, so you, yeah, you can see here, as soon as there was overlap, the signal changed completely. So this wasn't a good time. I'm, at this point, I, I, I'll be honest, I shelved the project for a little bit while I focused on things that made me happy. Um, and I wasn't, ha I mean, I wasn't happy about this and I assumed this is gonna be hard. Um, I don't know how I'm gonna get this timing exactly right and get it in phase and all of these things, so I just left it alone. Um, something important to take away from this is I was wrong. Um, I thought I had hypotheses about why it was working the way it was, and the hurdles in my head were entirely artificial. Um, and so, yeah, I, I had to get over that before I tried it again and realized that what I thought was the case was not. Um, and also trying something that doesn't explicitly work is also often a good way to discover how things function. So even if it doesn't give you the result you want, if you get some different output, um, you get a better idea of how the thing works internally. Um, I took this from Leon's slide. He did a, a keynote um, at Hexcon. Um, yeah, and, and I think the context is a bit different, but the premise is similar. Um, and it's about artificial hurdles. So thinking, you know, this has already been done. You don't want to do it again because, well, people have done this, or it's too easy, or, or there's this artificial thing that you think, well, this can't work because I think this is how this functions or whatever. Even if that's true, even if you can't... Um, you don't figure out how the thing works, if you don't crack it, trying more stuff teaches you something about how the thing works and can lead you in a different direction. So I think there's value in pushing on when things get tough and to try and fight against those artificial hurdles. So that's my um, motivational talk for the day. Anyway, so this was kind of the crux of the next section was security features and reliability features can often look the same. So in this case, the changing pattern meant that it was somehow confirming that the reflections were being detected. Um, if it was security, then I would expect a fixed offset. So I'm reading my slides, but I did write down what I wanted to say. Um, basically, anti-interference techniques can look a lot the same as security, but they won't necessarily be as stringent. Um, so with that in mind, um, sometimes if you think it's secure, Maybe it's just trying to be reliable and you can still get away with some nonsense if you, you try harder. <laughs> the reason that this is likely to be um, 
anti-interference and not security features is because this device is mass produced. It has no branding on it. It isn't made by anyone. It just, it wills itself into existence <laughs> by the magic of China and it ends up on a boat. And then we get it and we sell it and someone makes a lot of money and it's wonderful. Um, but if you think about that, like the R&D time to make something like this secure is not gonna, like it, that's not a thing. So it just needs to be reliable, and they are reliable. You put your hand in front of them, they're open. That's all you want. So, yeah, if you start thinking about it like that, these cheap Chinese devices probably aren't trying to, you know, be super secure. Chances are they're just designed with the minimum requirements to make it reliable. So let's test this and see what happens. Right, so there's a lot of words here, but basically, there, there may be a chance to fix this if we just try and emit the second pattern. So instead of emitting anything in the first place, we just start with pattern number two and see what happens. Because at some point, that is going to intersect with the emitted pattern, and it's going to change the pattern. But now we're already emitting the thing it's expecting to get. Maybe that'll work. So same thing as we did in the first place. Exactly the same process, except the timing is now different. So we've got those, plug it into a thing that generates light, and boom, in my office, I'm opening the door. See the red line goes up, and it comes down again. So that's cool. So now we've managed to spoof a signal that actually makes a door open. The problem is those red lines. Those red lines signify where I put my hand in front of the sensor and move it away again to block the light that I'm emitting. For some reason, my constant barrage of signal was getting blocked out as interference by the receiver. And if you look at the data sheet again, again, data sheet is the Bible of any hardware component, if you can find it. Um, there is quite a lot of suppression um, of interference uh, for, from various things, mostly at fluorescent lamps, but other stuff as well. Um, and that's probably what we're doing. We're just triggering this uh, disturbance pattern rejection. So look at the timing again. With the empty space on either side and that, it's about 85 seconds. So let's try blast it for 85 sec milliseconds and then be quiet for 100. So pause on that. Successful attack compromises of the correct carrier frequency and correct pulse pattern. That's only two things. The pulse pattern's a bit iffy um, to figure out because it could be 500 microseconds, it could be 30 milliseconds. That's a big gap, and if your high time and your low time aren't correct, then it might not work. So there's a pretty wide range. The carrier frequency, however, is fairly easy to get right, because it's probably going to be something between 30 and 40 kilohertz in one kilohertz jumps. So you've got about 10, say 11 options there. Um, anyway, so that's, that's kind of the attack on any of these things um, that I've figured out. So the next thing was to build some hardware for it. So 3D printing is cool if you download stuff off Thingiverse, but it's extra cool if you start designing stuff from like for specific purposes. And it, it just blows my mind how you can just make a thing from nothing and then suddenly it exists in two hours. Um, so that was my first prototype of a blaster because of course I want range, this is the thing. So I had a tiny LED inside my office, it was working. I don't want that, I want to open this thing from far away. So that's an LED with a heat sink on the back. There's a lens to focus it nice and tight. Then I put a laser on the side because I thought that would be cool and made space for the PCB. Oh, that, that came later, but there's the laser. I like it because it says danger on, on the laser. <laughs> it makes the whole thing look a lot more scary. Um, and then a third design where I shove the, the janky PCB at the back there. And you can see there's the X uh, targeting laser. So now the question is, does this actually work? Now, I've done this talk once, and for those of you who saw it would have seen I had a tripod and I had that janky thing on it. Um, but that's not really practical if you are to, like if you're doing a red team and you want to get in somewhere, you can't like whip out your tripod, <laughs> get your power supply, connect the like, dodgy exposed PCB and blast like, people are going to ask questions. So what I wanted to do was make this more compact, more portable. So this is what I 
had in mind is this the right one yes so this is a torch you can buy it from take a lot or very mark wherever it's quite bright and it's got this cool function where you can adjust the focus so you can make it super tight sorry for those in the front um, yeah it's got a rechargeable battery it's a nice torch so what if we take the torch as a platform and we build all of that stuff into that so I'm gonna switch off the mic as I walk across because otherwise the speaker's gonna shout at me. So we have a sensor. You can see it's a normal no touch sensor, I haven't changed anything. There's a light so that it's easier for me to see what's happening. If I take this light and I shine it, then nothing happens, because it's a torch. <laughs> <laughs> but if you take this one, <laughs> so what's cool about that is that I, you may have seen, I didn't pull it out, I didn't zoom in or do anything, I just had that big wide beam and obviously, if I make it tighter, it's going to be more intensity, and it's going to work better. So if we do the same thing, sorry, I had an unfortunate, well, unfortunate uh, hotel accident yesterday, and I broke myself. Um, you can bounce it off a wall. So I could probably put it at the back of the room and trigger it from there, but like you get the point. It works from far away, um, and it works fairly reliably, and it would probably switch more frequently, but I'm actually switching between two different patterns, which I'll get to the relevance of that just now. But that made me feel a lot like this guy. <laughs> Um, partly because he's got the cast on, but also I, I feel like a combination of the two. Like the guy who invents the cool stuff and then the James Bond who walks around with the, the crime tools um, doing, doing secret agent things. Um, so yeah, this is the torch I used. It's, uh, it works, you can see it from two nautical miles away, whatever that means. <laughs> um, but I went to the shops and I bought it and modified the inside of it. So you can see there's uh, the circuit, there's the little red arrow pointing at the actual controller that does the switching, um, and the, it'll generate the signal, and then on the right hand side at the bottom is the, the LED. And I mean, this is not a very big, I mean, it's not a, it's the tiniest torch, but the entire thing has to fit in the head. So this is quite a, a challenge. So shout out to Dylan for listening to all of my rants about how hardware is not supposed to work. Um, yeah, the next thing was other vendors. Um, turns out some of these things are even easier. So this one, if I were to have it on top of there, I don't because I didn't, I ran out of time to set up a test jig for it. But if that one was there, it would also be triggered and it actually goes green and stays green. Like it doesn't even switch off. And that's because the torch is switching between the two, but in less than a second. And so while it's, before it switches back off, it's getting triggered again, and so, yeah, this can be used for these ones and those ones, and it's it's pretty reliable. Look, Leon, I put a video in my PowerPoint. It's just a video of me playing with it outside, with it switching between the two different protocols. So, yeah, that was, that was quite fun. Um, right, we broke into a library, because, <laughs> I mean, it was time for some practical attacks, right? Like doing this in a room is kind of boring. Like it doesn't let me in anywhere, nothing happens. So we actually found somewhere where there was access control on the outside, a glass door, and then I used the knowledge to reflect my light. So there were books on a bookshelf. I think there were like 30 books in this library. It wasn't the best library, but anyway. We got in and we weren't supposed to be there. We also triggered the sensor on the other side of the room because we had light of sight. 
and we confused the nonsense out of the cleaning lady who was outside because she heard the door click open and nobody was even in the room. So that was cool. I also broke into a block of flats in town where there was a five-ish meter path, an alcove to the side, a sensor inside, and I bounced it off the wall. Like, actually, it doesn't matter. As long as it's letting in me into somewhere I'm not supposed to be, I'm happy. So it works, is the point. And yeah. So the next steps were, were laser, um, but that's done. But the, the X, while it looks cool, it, it's not very bright, and so it's not super, super helpful. Runtime adjustment of parameters would be cool to be able to change the carrier frequencies, to adjust the timing. I've, enc I've encountered two of these sensors where I couldn't open them. Um, same vendor, well, I say vendor, they don't have a name, but they look the same. Um, but they, they just didn't respond to the torch. Put your hand in front of them, they work fine. So I need to figure out what the difference is there. But to be able to change the parameters means I could fiddle, you know, adjust the carrier frequency, change the timing and try and brute force it into working. And then to be able to actually receive the LED, uh, the light emitted by the sensor to detect what the carrier was and what the timing is. Um, see, I still have five minutes. So that's, that's kind of my next steps um, to try and make it a bit more versatile. But for now, covering two vendors, um, it works for 90, 95% of everything I've tried. Um, I also tried straight line. <laughs> Um, the range, and I managed to trigger it from 30 meters away. Um, I call it the Yeti because it's like the Yeti pictures where it's a green blob in the distance, and <laughs> I, I promise it's the sensor switching on. Um, but the kind of takeaway from this is that this is not good. Um, <laughs> because in reality, these things are used in secure areas because people are fooled by the premise that they are secure and that they are, that you can only trigger them by putting your hand in front of the thing, which you can't do if you're not in the room unless you have this torch, in which case you can. Um, but they don't know that. And yeah, this is kind of a tricky one. There's a couple of uh, questions here. Um, so th they should only be used as convenience buttons, really, not security measures. They shouldn't be used inside sensitive areas, kind of refer to point one. They shouldn't be used where an attacker has line of sight or can even see a wall. Like, you shouldn't really use them unless they're dispensing soap or doing something, <laughs> something else. So I don't know if you've noticed, but I was really disappointed when I got here for the first time and I saw exit buttons that were buttons. So in this building, they use buttons. So. I thought it would be quite cool to demo it here, but that's not happening. Um, and then for manufacturers, so there are answers that I could suggest, but the point is I don't know who the manufacturer is. <laughs> These sensors will themselves into existence because of a, a market demand and then people sell them. And I don't know how, like, I don't know where they come from. So. I mean, it's funny, but it's also a genuine issue. Like, what do you do about responsible disclosure? I can't contact the vendors and say, well, this doesn't work. Um, and so at the end of the day, my, my answer to it is just awareness from people who implement these things. Um, I did go to an office um, a while ago, and I managed to get all the way into their secure area. Um, and they have since resolved the issue. But like, that, was, that raised awareness. Um, so. Um, I'm not selling these things to the public yet. <laughs> I'm having some ethical conversations with myself. We'll see how that goes. Um, but yeah, that's, that's, that's basically it. It's, it's a hard problem to solve because it's hardware. And with software, you know, you can update it. And now, well, the new version and everyone that gets deployed from now is patched. Whereas with this, you can't patch it. Like, you just have to replace it or use it differently. So the only real answer for me is to get implementers to think about these things differently. Um, and for it, you know, people who understand how these things work to be, you know, asking the right questions, basically. So my takeaways <laughs> are to be curious. That is how all of this came about. Um, I, I looked at the sensors and I thought, well, these things don't look complicated or expensive, so I wonder if we can fool them into thinking they've picked up a hand, and it turns out you can. Um, the other thing is to break things. 
It doesn't actually break anything, but I have been doing this for a while. Um, but if you do break something, well, that's like, it's actually okay. Like maybe you waste a little bit of money, but you've probably learned something in the process. And I think that that scares people away from hardware hacking more than it should. Um, except if you break yourself, but most hardware hacking is low voltage, so you should be okay. <laughs> and the last one, which I think is the most important, is to push through when it gets challenging. So the things that stop me, I bought that in 2019, I'll remind you. This research isn't old research, I did it this year. It's taken me like that long to just sit down and focus and get through it and convince myself that the problems that I was facing were artificial until I had confirmed them or disproven them. So the easiest part of this stuff was doing the stuff I already knew, and then beyond that, it was a learning experience, which has been valuable. And now I've, you know, I'm at a point where I'm standing here talking to you. So, yeah, push through when it gets challenging. Don't let that discourage you when you know things get hard. That's when you learn the most. And turns out that the hurdles I thought I had were just artificial, and it was actually technically quite a simple, simple attack. So, yeah. That's me. Thank you for listening. <laughs> Any questions? <laughs> yes, you. Uh, so these things is also used in a lot of embalming groups, like you were saying, so the sphinx and the I, I've made a lot of mess on some tiles. <laughs> <laughs> Um, the one that I that I set off by accident, yes. Um, <laughs> I, I don't. So it depends, right? So the sensors, uh, like again, TV remotes work on a different carrier frequency, so they won't pick this up. Um, the two vendors I've tried, they worked on two different carrier frequencies, so the one attack didn't work on the other. Um, but yeah, 30 kilohertz seems to work on some soap dispensers. So go mad, make a mess. <laughs> For this one was, well, it was there, it was 517 microseconds off, 600 and something on. And for the other one, it kind of didn't matter if there was a 31 kilohertz carrier just switched. Oh, okay. So that one was a lot less fussy, even though it looked like it was better designed. Yeah. Um, so yeah, it just depends on the device. There's one over there. Uh, no, it's just a crime torch, I guess. <laughs> yep. Uh, so, doing this infrared imaging, mm -hmm. do you think that you might be able to, well, one of your nodes is making it, um, it's a small form factor and getting some way to read modulation. Mm. Do you think you could roll this or kind of script this into a flipper zero? So I have actually looked at that. Um, Theoretically, there is a flipper zero in the world with the recording of the correct pattern. <laughs> I, haven't, I haven't tested whether it actually works, if it emits. I don't know if the carrier frequency is factored into that. That's the whole thing. Um, technically, yes. I think the emitter, you can have, you'd have to write some code for it, but it could be possible. The big issue is that the LED is small and weak, and this LED is big and strong. And that, I mean, that's the main thing. So this is a five watt LED. Um, the biggest like normal form factor LED I could find was 0.2 watts um, with a very narrow beam angle, but um, in this case, I'm just throwing a lot of power at the problem. So a flipper zero would work, but I think by default, the range would be quite limited. But technically, yes. Yeah, if it's got an, if uh, it switches quickly enough, then yeah. I don't have one. I just have this Verimark one. But <laughs> it was pretty cheap. It, you know, it's kind of fun. Works. Cool. I think that's it. Thanks, everyone. Enjoy the rest of the day.